Okay, so hello everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to um, announce Mohamed Abdel Fattah today as today's speaker. So Mohamed is an assistant professor at Cornell uh, University. Um, he did his bachelor at the German University in Cairo and then a master actually in Stuttgart, in Germany, and then his PhD at the University of Toronto. Um, now his research group focuses on designing the next generation of uh, machine learning centered computer systems for both data centers and mobile devices. Um, and yeah, today he's going to talk about new architecture research um, that is hardware aware. So with that, um, loss is yours. Okay, all right. Thank you, Aaron, for the invitation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about ways of making neural architecture search both fast and hardware aware. Um, so I'll start by just, you know, this motivation slide showing that, you know, the compute volume has increased dramatically in the age of deep neural networks. Uh, one nice observation is that, you know, in the same model family to go from, you know, to increase just 1% uh, in terms of, uh, you know, task accuracy, in this case, image classification, we need to actually double the computation from ResNet 50 to ResNet 101, for example. So this exponential increase in compute volume and model size is almost unsustainable. We need to do computation in terms of, you know, billions of multiply accumulate operations and hardware and you know our compute resources aren't keeping up and to compare this to a kind of the age before dnns we used to use for the same task this thing called the histogram of gradient classifier and this was like you know 10 million max so about three orders of magnitude cheaper than any of those deep neural network models here but the accuracy was obviously stuck at like 30 to 40 percent so we need to go to dnns uh, we are you know in the age of dnns now but they're too large they're too compute heavy and so we need to find a way to mitigate that. And you know, one clear way, and obviously what I'm going to talk about today is you know, AutoML. So if we look at all of these models doing the same task, image classification on ImageNet in this case, uh, using automated design techniques for these neural networks is able to really kind of bring them back in kind of the sub 1 billion Mac regime, uh, which, which is cutting us a lot of the way there uh, in terms of you know, making these models a lot more efficient. So I really think it's the right tool to design DNNs, um, you know, and it's really part of that answer. However, this is again only part of the story because I'm showing, you know, nice image classification models here. Maybe it's kind of solved for those models and for smaller data sets. But if we look at these large language models, for example, when I created the slide, GPT-3 was the SOTA language model, and it's much bigger. It has 175 billion parameters, 10 to the power of 23 flops, just to train it. It costs so much, it costs like 4.6 million US dollars to train it, and it has a huge carbon footprint. So, um, so looking forward, you know, even the current techniques of automated machine learning are insufficient. We really need to think across, you know, both the neural network optimization, looking at the software stack and all the way down to the hardware and co-designing all of these parts and specializing it specifically for machine learning. Uh, most of this talk will be focusing kind of on the neural network side. I'll touch upon hardware as well. But uh, I, I'm just showing this GPT-3 model because I'm saying that you know, a lot of the problems that we're facing now are not solved. We solved it for you know, a nice class of models, uh, but not for everything. And you know, many of the talks, talks about AutoML that you'll probably hear may come from a data center company. So a company like Google, for example. And um, I will instead offer a perspective from a company like Samsung, which is a devices company. So how does that perspective differ? Um, so a company like Google has, you know, enormous computing resources. When I, well, when I Googled it, I found that it's estimated that they have about 1 million servers uh, around the globe. Um, so they can run a lot of automated machine learning algorithms. They can learn, run a lot of NAS. They have the capacity to do a lot of trial and error, essentially. Um, another feature of these kind of companies is that their hardware is somewhat uniform. In fact, in the case of Google, they created their own TPU. Okay, so they have three generations or four generations of the TPU, but that's just four. And maybe they have their pixel chip in their phone, but that's it. They need to optimize their models for five or six devices. Whereas where I come from, so uh, a lot of the AutoML work I did was within Samsung, and they are a devices company. So they have literally hundreds of devices. So even for each class of devices, they have different versions. So were their phones for any specific generation, they have three tiers, like low tier, mid tier, high tier, 
And even within each tier, they have different chips like Exynos versus Snapdragon for different markets around the world. And uh, so the same goes for their TVs and they have even more uh, in, in terms of the ranges for their TVs, their smartwatches, their uh, fridges and the robots. So you have so many devices that you want to customize models for. And that's just you know, a linear growth in the number of uh, you know, auto ML runs that you need to do or neural architecture search runs that you need to do. Uh, another aspect of this is that you know Samsung is a devices company, so they don't have one million servers waiting there to run neural networks. Um, so you know you need to run a lot of NAS, but you don't have a lot of servers to do it. So you need to make that NAS really hardware aware. It needs to be customized for each device, and at the same time you need to make it efficient. You need to be able to run it quickly because you don't have the luxury of running it you know on a bunch of um, servers. So so that that's kind of the main theme of what I'll talk about today. Uh, efficientness and hardware awareness to uh, ultimately in our case was to kind of optimize models for these kind of different devices. Uh, yeah, so that's the first thing, efficient neural architecture search, hardware aware, uh, neural uh, auto ML in general. And finally, I'll talk about a couple of application case studies to show that how we actually applied some of these techniques to models that Samsung used today. So the first one is efficientness. So, um, you know, um, you know, AutoML 101 or Neural Architecture Search 101, how do you do it in the kind of canonical way? You know, you have a searching algorithm. It proposes a deep neural network. Let's say it proposes this green one here. Um, and then, you know, you take that neural network, you train it, you get accuracy. And then that accuracy is fed back into your searching algorithm. And somehow it influences it to propose, you know, a different and better neural network, ideally. And so then you do that again and again and again until you find the model that matches your criteria. Uh, and that works. Uh, obviously, this is really slow because it's iterative and it has this thing called training, which takes you know hours, uh, days, or weeks, or months in some cases. So the two ways in which we try to make this faster is first, you know, finding more efficient search algorithms. So basically, reducing the number of iterations, improving the sample efficiency of these searching algorithms uh, to get to a good model. And then the second thing that we'll tackle is you know looking at this evaluation phase and making it much faster. So how can we replace training or augment training with some other proxy um, that is much faster than you know full training of a deep neural network? So let's talk about the first one. So uh, in this case, we looked at this idea of a predictor-based search. Uh, and so what is a predictor-based search? You know, you have a neural network topology. You input a description of that into a predictor, which itself could be a neural network, like an MLP or something, or a GCN in our case. Um, and then you predict the accuracy of that neural network. So you can use this thing here to do NAS because you can you know, input multiple neural networks here and then you can choose the best one with the highest accuracy. So that's quite simple. Um, our observation was mainly that you, know, you don't need to predict the actual accuracy of a model. Within an NAS search space, you're just trying to find the best model. So what you actually want to do is that you know, what we do down here, this binary relation prediction. And so that was our contribution that we Instead of you know, predicting the absolute accuracy of a model and doing it kind of uh, finding a numerical value at the output of that predictor, which is uh, quite challenging, instead we turn it into a binary classification problem. So we take two models at the inputs, A and B in this case, and our binary relation predictor, the task of it is just to you know, find the model that is better. It should predict whether A is better or B is better with some you know, confidence. So we turn it into a binary classification problem. And we found that, you know, uh, even compared to the best sample-based searching algorithm at the time, which was aging evolution, uh, we were able to improve its, uh, its sample efficiency by more than two and a half x. So this is, you know, the canonical, you know, NAS, um, you know, um, graph here with number of trained models on the x-axis. So obviously, lower is better, and the average, um, you know, the best test accuracy found so far, so higher is better. So, um, so we were able to make that a lot more efficient. Uh, so how did we get there? So this is what our model looks like. We have a stack of GCN layers, and we use GCNs, which are graph uh, convolutional neural networks, because we believe that they learn the structure uh, of the input neural network description a lot better than you know a standard vanilla um, MLP or something. So uh, so we compare that. Uh, so uh, we compare that to you know a vanilla GCN. What we call a vanilla GCN is kind of what was done before, basically taking a stack of GCNs and just predicting the absolute accuracy. So that's our baseline here. 
And we find that you know, using this binary relation prediction improves accuracy a bit. It's not, it doesn't actually get us all the way there, um, but it improves it a bit uh, compared to the vanilla GCN, just because we convert this from you know, this regression problem to this binary classification problem. Uh, but you still have this kind of upfront cost until this dotted line here, where you know, you're paying this upfront cost just to train your predictor. So you haven't really started using it yet for uh, ranking models or finding the right models. So our next trick was to do this thing that we called iterative data selection. So in that previous slide I showed, you know, we train the predictor using 100 models, and then we uh, start to use it for predicting you know, which model is best. Um, but instead of training these 100 models all in one go, we do it iteratively. So we, for example, split it into 20 models. We train those 20 models. So that's this TDNNs here. So we train the predictor on a small number of models. And then we use that predictor, which isn't really good at that point, but we still use it to sort uh, a bunch of models, maybe N models, which is much bigger than T, much bigger than the number of models we used to train. Um, and this step is really fast. But then we take the best models out of those n models and we use it to train the predictor again. So now you know we trained it using 20 models, now we're training it using 20 more models, so 40 models, and we keep doing that again and again until we hit the 100 model budget of our training, right? So we train the model iteratively, gradually closing in on the best models in the search space. So that's the key thing. So the uh, even though at the beginning, you know, we're not really finding the best models, but towards the end, the predictor is becoming really good in finding those best models. So this has a very interesting effect that we observed uh, in our paper as well. Um, if you compare, you know, normal training, which is just taking the predictor training it on 100 random points versus this iterative training that slowly, you know, trains on the better models in the search space, your average rank correlation coefficient actually drops. So your predictor becomes worse at ranking models across the whole search space. So isn't that bad? Like, isn't that, that means, you know, iterative data selection is bad. It doesn't work. No, actually, if we zoom in into the best models in the search space, which are actually the models that we care about. So we want our NAS algorithm, we, we don't care if the NAS algorithm you know, is able to rank models that are the worst models in, in, in my search space. We don't care about those models. We just want to get to the good models really quickly. And so if we zoom in at the, you know, the top models in the search space here, we find, we find that our iterative, you know, um, that our iterative algorithm is much better at ranking those top models. And so, uh, so eventually that translates into a much better, um, you know, a much faster search time um, in our, um, in our, uh, a much more efficient, you know, predictor in our uh, NAS search. So here I'm showing, you know, the improvement when we do both, uh, we use this idea of binary relation prediction and iterative data selection. So it's the combination of both of them that really gives us this major speed up over, you know, the baseline vanilla GCN model that I show here. Um, so yeah, so, so that was kind of an overview of BRP NAS, binary relation predictor based NAS, uh, and the two components that really make it much more powerful than a traditional or more conventional predictor based search algorithm. Uh, the second thing I'll talk about is uh, inexpensive proxies to replace DNN training. Um, and there we started by looking at what do people do in practice. And we found that, you know, um, by and large, all neural architecture search work uh, simply use the reduced form of training to, um, to replace the evaluation phase of NAS. So basically, you know, instead of training for the full number of epochs, you know, the easiest thing is just to reduce the number of epochs and then take the accuracy mid-training and use that as a proxy for the model performance, uh, which, I mean, it works quite well. Uh, other ways of doing it is also to use a smaller model to subsample the training data set or to use the lower resolution input. Uh, so the first work to actually take this and analyze these kind of proxies uh, was, you know, in 2020, uh, in CBPAR 2020, this paper called Econest. So I really appreciated that, you know, they took it, they systematically analyzed these proxies that were taken for granted before. So they analyzed these proxies on 50 models, and they tuned these, you know, uh, these different parameters, you know, the number of epochs, they said, you know, one-tenth of the full training is, is good. The resolution and the model size, one quarter of those uh, works really well, and they used the whole training data set. So they found this, you know, this formula or a, a NAS proxy that works well. They evaluated this on 50 models. They found that you know, this proxy um, has a good rank correlation coefficient with the final accuracy of like 0.87. Uh, 
And because you know we're reducing training in so many ways, the theoretical runtime of this proxy is actually really fast. Uh, so it, it should theoretically run at the time equivalent to 1 25th of an epoch, which is not any, right? Um, so we, we started from there. We took this proxy, this Econet, what we call it, Econet proxy, and we evaluated on a bigger data set. So um, 15K models, or okay, it has some duplicates, but thousands of models anyways, uh, from NASBench 201. And we found the first observation is that, you know, the correlation coefficient drops. So, uh, so you actually needed to tune this proxy for each data set. Uh, it doesn't work out of the box. And by the time you tune it, you've already paid that you know, extra computation cost. Uh, but anyway, just taking this you know, canonical proxy that they um, decided was good didn't work for NASBench 201. And when we benchmarked the runtime uh, on an actual GPU, the actual runtime was about five full epochs because you need to kind of load all of the data sets. You need to, you're using a GPU, which is a you know, heavyweight device used for large computations. You don't actually realize this theoretical improvement in runtime. You uh, you were stuck with uh, a relatively slow proxy here. So we said, okay, if these you know proxies that everyone uses are already that inaccurate, uh, but NAS work still works, right? Um, why don't we go to kind of something that is really low cost and see empirically or test empirically how well it works? And at that time, this idea of pruning as initialization was really kind of coming up. The idea there is that, you know, you take a single mini batch of data, you put it through a neural network, compute the loss, do back propagation, and then you compute the simple equation by multiplying, you know, the gradient of the loss with respect to a parameter times the initial parameter value. And somehow, you know, that gave you a saliency of that parameter. That told you how important that parameter was for um, that neural network. And our approach was kind of uh, really a simple addition to that was to sum up all of those saliencies across the whole neural network. And then that would be kind of a score for that neural network signifying how good that neural network is compared to others in the search space. And you know, it's, it's mainly based on intuition. Uh, there are um, theoretical foundations in pruning, of course, apply. But uh, at the same time, we're, we're just trying to you know, measure the trainability of this neural network by looking at the initial gradient flow. And it takes into account the initial parameter values and the data set because we pass a single mini batch of data through it. And so there is some intuition, but the key thing here is the empirical evaluation. So we take again NASBench 201. I remember Econas, you know, uh, the rank correlation coefficient was 0.6 approximately, and the cost was about five full epochs. When we tried our zero cost proxies, we found that we can get up to 0.82 correlation, correlation coefficient uh, with final accuracy by just this single mini batch of data. And the cost of it was nothing. Uh, because you actually load a single mini batch, you pass it through the model once, you realize all of your speed up actually when you benchmark this on an actual GPU. So it's really fast to compute these proxies. So now at this point, we have, we have some lead telling us that we can have a proxy for NAS that's really fast, but we have like zero guarantees that it will work across data sets or something. So um, in the paper, we actually go and we evaluate it on a bunch of data sets to show that this still has a meaningful signal, even for different kinds of tasks, different data sets, uh, and different kinds of models as well, even on kind of models in the wild. And so we do that due diligence. But at the same time, we think of very low risk ways of integrating them within existing NAS uh, search algorithm. The idea is to leverage kind of the strength of good NAS uh, search algorithms and leverage the uh, you know, low cost of, um, of the zero cost proxies. And so we call them zero cost warm up and zero cost move proposal. Um, to explain those, I'll quickly go through how uh, a popular NAS algorithm works. So aging evolution, and uh, aging evolution, like most evolutionary algorithm, you know, starts with this evolution pool. We initialize it with uh, randomly with a bunch of neural networks, maybe sixteen neural networks in this case. Um, and then you know the next step is to take the best neural network out of that pool. We mutate it, so that means we change it in some way. Um, and then we train that mutation, and then we add it back to the pool. Um, and so that's how we kind of explore new, um, you know, new, new uh, neural networks. Uh, and then in the case of aging evolution, we evict the oldest model in that pool. So the, the model that was there for the longest time. Um, and so how do we augment this algorithm with these zero cost proxies in a low risk way? Uh, first, instead of initializing the pool randomly, we do something called zero cost warm up. So we take a bunch of models, so a large number of models, maybe it's a thousand models, 
And then we compute the zero cost metric for all those 1000 models and take the top 16, put them in the evolution pool. So, you know, if our proxy gives us, you know, um, uh, already kind of gives us the better models, then we started with a really strong evolution pool with good candidates inside. And so that's zero cost hormone. And the other thing is zero cost move proposal. So in the move proposal phase of NAS, uh, in aging evolution, for example, instead of mutating just one deep neural network uh, or doing one mutation, we perform all possible mutations. So in the case of NAS Bench 2, for example, that was about 16 different mutations on average. And in the case of larger data sets, it went up to 25 different mutations. But we run all of those mutations using our zero cost proxies, which are really fast. Um, and then we take the best one, the one that has the highest zero cost score, and that's the one that we actually do full training for before putting it back into the evolution pool. Uh, and so these are the two kind of uh, our low risk ways of augmenting existing search algorithm. So we tried that on you know random search, and so uh, again these are the NAS curves, you know trained models on the x-axis, best accuracy on the y-axis. The blue curve here is showing the baseline search algorithm. So that's just random search. It's quite poorly performing because it's random. Um, but here is what happens when we augment it with the zero cost proxies. So there's a significant increase, like it's 50x better in terms of you know, runtime and improves accuracy of the same number of search model by about 2%, uh, which is quite significant. And so we augmented random search. Uh, we augmented reinforcement learning, again, with different kinds of you know, move proposal and warm up regimes. And again, it's 25 times faster than the baseline random uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, we again went to aging evolution. It's 10 times faster in that case. Um, and finally, we even went to the binary relation predictor that I presented at the beginning of this of these slides, which was already the fastest search algorithm before. And we uh, were the fastest sample based search algorithm before. And we made it even faster. So we reduced you know, the number of um, samples to get a certain accuracy by 30 out of 50 here, which is like a 3x speed up or something. So, um, so this is really good. So now we have the zero cost proxies. We have empirical data to suggest that they tell you something about how good the network is. And we have a way of integrating it within you know, these four popular NAS algorithms without, you know, um, uh, and, and you can only kind of speed up those algorithms essentially. Uh, so so it's, it's, kind of a, it's, it's kind of a nice thing. So, um, so these are the two ways. So the first one, you know, the more efficient search algorithm, this binary relation prediction stuff. And uh, the second thing is to speed up the evaluation phase of NAS using these zero cost proxies. There is more work there, but, um, but still kind of uh, in progress. So, so we can talk about it more uh, afterwards. So, so now I jump into kind of um, the next part of this talk, which is hardware aware auto ML. So as I said, you know, um, Samsung is a devices company. So in this, you know, auto ML search formulation, we don't just care about accuracy, we care about how fast these neural networks run on our devices. So, you know, Samsung TVs have these specialized chips for super resolution because, you know, they create those large displays, but they don't have content to fill the pixels on those displays. So we have 8K when the content is 4K and we had 4K when the content was, you know, um, HD. And then we have obviously the Samsung phones where you want to run on device speech recognition and you want to run on device, you know, um, camera pipeline enhancements and things like that. So when you're training a neural network, you don't just care about um, how well it performs in terms of accuracy, you also care about the latency. So how can we tailor the neural networks to hardware? So when we looked in the literature, we found that, you know, people used a number of operations as a proxy for, um, for device latency in many cases. I mean, it, is, it does correlate a bit, but you know, if we plot the number of uh, flops on the x-axis here and the measured latency on some of our devices on the y-axis, we found that you know, a model with the same number of flops can have any kind of latency across that spectrum. So it's not a really good indication actually of, um, of, 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 of model latency on, on a mobile phone or, or even on a GPU or something actually a really poor predictor and you know we shouldn't really use that uh, for hardware awareness. The next best thing that people started using is a layer wise model. So you take um, you know an S model. So maybe this is a neural network here, you have different layers. You, you measure the runtime for the first layer, three milliseconds, for example, the second layer, five milliseconds, and the third layer, two milliseconds, then you add them up. 
And this is nice because it's a divide and conquer approach. You can actually benchmark all the possible layers on all the possible devices in a reasonable time. Um, and so we took that again. We, uh, this, these measurements are also for kind of the entire NASBench two data set. Uh, we took this layer-wise model. We uh, looked at you know the layer-wise model on the x-axis here and the measured latency on the y-axis, and it's much better than flops. But still, the the model is not that great at predicting the actual latency uh, that runs on the device. And so our approach was different. So we took a neural network. We Put it, we put the structure through a graph neural network again, uh, very similar to the one we used for BRPNAS, and we predicted its accuracy. So obviously we trained this with a bunch of models at the beginning, but you know that means you need to do like a hundred or, or something measurements on your device at the beginning of NAS. So it's really kind of a negligible startup cost, I think. Um, and then when you put neural two uh, new neural networks on it, it predicts how fast these will run. And when we look here, you know, um, this performs much better than the previous approaches. And uh, concretely, you know, 97% of the points here are within a tolerance of 10% uh, to the actual measured latency. Whereas previously, um, with these layer-wise models, which again people were taking for granted, only 33% of those models were within that tolerance. Um, so, um, so we were happy with this, you know. Um, uh, GNN-based uh, predictor, and we actually, to do this investigation, we had to do a bunch of measurements. So we actually open sourced a large latency data set on uh, six mobile devices, um, and we also open sourced the GNN predictor, um, showing how it works on, the, on those. So, um, so, oh yeah, so, I mean, it's not enough to actually say that, um, you know, we are able to predict latency better. Okay, that's that's good to say. But we also need to measure concretely whether this improves uh, the kind of models that you find um, uh, through your neural architecture search problem. So we take it and we, you know, compare in this case aging evolution with, you know, measured latency. So that's in green here, with our GCN-based prediction predictor. So that's in orange here, and with a layer-wise predictor. So that's in blue here. So you, you see kind of the gap is quite clear. You're able to find better models more quickly when you have an accurate uh, latency predictor for the device. Um, so, um, so we're really close to what the measured latency would give us. Um, so the next step beyond this was we don't just want to, you know, um, design a neural network that works for a specific kind of hardware really well. We want to design both the neural network and the hardware together so that they both kind of fit in together really well. They both are kind of co-designed together automatically. So we augment the NAS problem with a new kind of search phase, so a hardware search phase. And we augment the evaluation phase with not just accuracy and latency, but also you know, the power and area of our hardware device. So this is kind of a toy diagram of what hardware would look like, for example. And you know, the key thing that we're going after here is that you know, DNNs are from a hardware perspective, and I have a lot of background in hardware. Like we used to get a task like compression, for example, there is a specific standard you have to follow and you have to accelerate that specific thing on hardware. So you don't have a lot of leeway. Sometimes you can change some parameters of that algorithm, the compression algorithm to suit your hardware better, but you can't really fundamentally change it. Whereas with neural networks, you can fundamentally change the neural network structure. You can go from transformers to convolutions, to separable convolutions, to skip connections, to dense nets, to res nets, and they all do the same thing. Okay, slightly different accuracies, um, but they all do the same thing. So um, there's a real opportunity here for co-designing hardware and neural network that work really well together. Um, and so we explore this automated code design idea by basically coming up with a very simple proof of concept. So we take a simple search space. I think that was um, equivalent to the NASBench 1 search space at the time. And we take a very simple accelerator based on FPGAs, where you, know, you have convolution engines, they have some parameters, you have different buffer sizes that you can choose from, different memory interface width, uh, and whether a dedicated pooling engine exists or not. And this hardware was hand optimized by FPGA engineers, specifically for the ResNet and GoogleNet models. So that was the only thing it can do really well. And so we take those two search spaces, we put them in an S uh, search problem. We use reinforcement learning for that. So both the CNN search space and accelerator design space together. We propose a pair of uh, you know, CNN and accelerator. We evaluate all of these parameters. We actually didn't do power, but we just use the area. 
Um, and then we, we crafted the multi-objective reward function. It went back to our enforcement learning controller. And you know, we did this again and again. Um, and so, um, so, so now we have this kind of combined uh, search problem. And the question is, can we outperform the um, accelerator on ResNet and GoogleNet for which that accelerator was hand designed by hardware experts by just tuning the parameter of that uh, you know, hardware accelerator, can we make it better at running you know, um, completely different neural networks? Uh, and so to test that, we ran our co-design nests for a bunch of iterations, and we gradually increased uh, our cutoff you know, performance per area. So on the x-axis here, I have you know, a hardware slash um, a hardware relevant metric, really. So performance, which captures latency and throughput, and area, uh, which captures you know, the overhead. So performance per area gives us the efficiency of that model. And on the y-axis, I still have accuracy because that's our multiple objectives. I have accuracy, uh, latency, and area. And I'm plotting here uh, kind of the ResNet cell and the Google Net cell. So th these are the two things that we're comparing to. So when we ran co-design mass, uh, after a few iterations, we found a model that we called COD1. Uh, and this one uh, outperformed uh, ResNet by 41% uh, in terms of performance per area, so in terms of efficiency, and about 2% in terms of uh, accuracy as well. So just by, by, by adding these parameters to an automated search space, we're able to outperform a hand-tuned accelerator um, quite significantly, like 2% accuracy and 40% uh, in terms of efficiency as well, simultaneously at the same time. So, uh, so this was really promising. We kept trying our, um, uh, our search as well. And we also found a model that's better than GoogleNet so on that same accelerator with the same kind of efficiency. Uh, the gap was a bit smaller, but at the same time, we did find something that outperformed um, the model that was you know, hand designed for that accelerator. So the bottom line here is that even this very simple proof of concept, uh, by simply adding these hardware parameters to our search problem, this, uh, this concept of a co-design NAS was able to find um, model hardware pairs that were much more efficient than you know, hardware experts going in and designing the hardware themselves. So I think this is really promising. And I really think the work we did here just amounts to a proof of concept. Uh, and there is a lot more work that could be done here, hopefully, in the future. OK, this brings me now to the last part of my talk. And I'll briefly go over a couple of application case studies to show how this all ties back into you know, Samsung products, uh, where I performed most of that work, uh, actually. So, um, and we'll focus more on kind of these hardware awareness, um, which is kind of bread and butter at Samsung. So the first one is uh, accelerating a super resolution model for Samsung TVs. And the second one is accelerating speech recognition for Samsung phones. Um, so for super resolution, we actually use a generative adversarial network at the time, uh, because that was the best thing that created kind of uh, a visually appealing image. Uh, and at the same time, an image that resembled the low resolution image. So these are, this is what is typically called, you know, perceptual and distortion uh, trade-off in super resolution. Perceptual meaning the image is visually appealing, and distortion means uh, or the distortion loss is, you know, uh, measuring how well um, the super resolution image matches the small one. So you don't uh, you want to just generate something that looks good but has nothing to do with the actual image. Uh, and so the way that GANs kind of achieve that balance of perceptual versus distortion is that they do this discriminator-based um, um, training. And so how does that work? That works, you know, you inject some random noise into a generator, and that generator produces some images. And you train it by putting those images through a discriminator with another kind of uh, uh, set of images, which are the real images from the training set. And the discriminator is trying to figure out which ones are real and which ones are fake. And once you're able to fool the discriminator uh, that your generator you know, is producing actual real images, then that means your generator is good enough, right? Um, and so um, our key contribution here was that you don't just need to search for the generator topology. And by the way, this is early enough that you know, at that time, people didn't really optimize these GAN search models. So that's why we get actually a really high um, um, improvement here, um, but yeah, when we when we take um, when we take this search problem, we 
we create a search space for both the generator and the discriminator. And we inspect kind of the role of the discriminator in that search. And we found that you know, if we use off-the-shelf discriminators, so this is you know, from SRGAN, ESRGAN, and JAGAN in this case, um, they perform much poorer than you know, these automatically searched uh, uh, discriminators that I'm showing here. Uh, and by the way, on the y-axis here, this is LPIPS, so lower is better. So basically, by searching for the discriminator as well as the generator, we were able to improve the perceptual kind of uh, part of uh, GANs for super resolution. Um, and so yeah, here we show our comparison of our TPSR, even against kind of really efficient super resolution models, um, it is much faster and much smaller um, while maintaining kind of um, really good accuracy. And so, um, so yeah, so there we did this GAN architecture search. We compared to uh, the really heavyweight, you know, um, super resolution models. And we have like almost a 30x improvement across both memory and compute with a small drop in accuracy. And so this was already good enough to run on device on Samsung TVs um, in that case. Uh, so the second thing I'll talk about is speech recognition. And in this case, it's not really um, automated. It's not really neural architecture search anymore because we're not looking for uh, a neural network topology. But instead, we are looking for uh, matrix ranks. We are trying to compress using singular value decomposition the different matrices within an encoder decoder based network with attention. So we take this end to end speech recognition model that was used at Samsung at the time. Um, it had you know, a bunch of encoders, uh, encoder LSTM, decoder LSTMs, and full attention between them. Um, and we, you know, we first manually investigated uh, the layer sensitivity to compression. So we took um, you know, the first layer here, uh, we tried to compress it. Uh, so on the x-axis, the further you go, the more compression you add. And on the y-axis, we're measuring word error rate. So lower is better. Um, and so as we're compressing it, you know, each layer kind of starts becoming completely useless after some time. Um, so we, we do that investigation. But then we, uh, we go a step further and say, OK, um, here is what you would do if you compress all the models using the same kind of uh, low rank value. They use the same matrix ranks for all of the, um, for all of the layers in the, in the models. So that's the blue thing here that we call manual SVD. Um, but then we using our plot from before, so this plot about layer sensitivity, we do some smarter layer compression. So we say, okay, so for very sensitive layers, we will not compress them you know, by 3x. We'll compress them by a very small amount or leave them uncompressed. But for the very uh, large models, we will, uh, for the very large models and insensitive models, we will compress them much more. So this is the black line here. So the question now becomes, can we outperform even a smart manual SVD-based compression with an automated SVD-based compression? Um, so you know we have this manual uh, manual regime where all the layers have the same matrix rank. We have the guided manual, uh, which is you know based on those layer sensitivity. We compress the model. We compress the layers based on how sensitive it is, and we have this AutoML kind of uh, case where we automatically search for uh, matrix ranks. And so the, all of these green dots here are automated search uh, points. And as we see, as the search progresses, first it starts you know, from a bunch of random points all over the place. Slowly, the search is focusing on kind of better models. And finally, we find a whole bunch of models that are much better than even the guided manual SVD at both compressing the model and, getting, uh, and preserving the accuracy for that model. So, uh, so yes, so in this case, again, a reinforcement learning based um, um, search algorithm was able to outperform even a smart manual compression by a, quite a large margin. Um, and to make our search faster, again, we inspected kind of uh, the data set and we looked at how to make it a bit smaller. So this is kind of one of those Econess proxies. And in this case, we just focused on subsampling the data set. In this case, it was Libri speech, I think, um, uh, the Libri speech validation test set. And we chose the top samples that had a high correlation coefficient with the word error rate of the entire data set. So this is quite interesting. How do you find you know, um, a few number of samples that represent the whole data set? 
So we took kind of a straightforward approach. We said, we will measure all the samples on a cohort of models. So a bunch of models from our search space with five or six or something. Um, we measured the word error rate on that five or six models, right? And we took the average word error rate after doing that. And we compared that to the average word error rate of the whole data set. And so we said, okay, then these are probably, you know, representative of the whole data set. So this plot here kind of shows it all. It shows the number of samples on the x-axis that you need and um, the correlation to the whole validation set uh, on the y-axis. So if you take a bunch of random models, if you take 100 random models, this is the correlation you get. If you take 200 random models, this is the correlation you get. But if you use our algorithm, which we called condense, I think, um, basically by focusing on taking representative samples um, from the data set, we were able to quickly find a very small data set, in this case, 83, uh, 83 samples that represented the whole data set in our search that were sufficient to represent the whole data set. Um, and so this actually shrunk our um, you know, data set by 67 times. Um, and so this worked really well for you know, speeding up the evaluation and ultimately going to a lot of evaluations here in our uh, NAS um, search algorithm. So, uh, so the final thing that we added on top of that, so by, by at this point, we went to kind of about 3.5x um, you know, compression of our um, you know, speech model. Um, the final thing is that we added this iterative training in between steps of compression. And usually with compression, you know, adding top of training really makes it much faster. Uh, much more, uh, much higher performance, I mean. And so uh, we set kind of the compression target to be 2x, uh, and we did that compression, uh, but then we did top up training to regain accuracy again. And then we set a more aggressive, you know, compression uh, target of 3x, and then we did again some iterative training in between, and so on until we hit 5x uh, in our case, um, uh, 5x compression of the model. Uh, without losing any accuracy, actually, in this case. So we were able to push this SVD-based compression for speech models, uh, speech recognition models, up to 5x by adding this iterative retraining, by compressing the evaluation um, validation data set, and by just using an RL-based search instead of manual uh, compression. So that was kind of our second application case study um, for real kind of Samsung devices. Um, achieved up to 5x compression and just, you know, using a simple compression method like low rank matrix factorization. And so this kind of brings me to the end uh, of this talk. What did I talk about? I talked about efficient neural architecture search, talked about two things. We did this binary uh, predictor based search, and we also talked about zero cost proxies for making NAS more hardware aware to kind of adapt models to all of these different devices. Uh, I talked about, you know, latency prediction and how we use GCNs to make that much more accurate. And then I also talked about, you know, the co-design of hardware with the neural network together. And then finally, I went quickly over two application case studies, so super resolution and speech recognition. So at this point, it's super important to say that, you know, I was just one of many people who made that work happen. So this was a picture of my team back at Samsung, uh, amazing set of people, uh, Honkai, Royce, and Javier. Uh, Lucas and Thomas, and uh, I presented this work today, but they uh, did most of it actually. So um, yeah, so this is a, a photo I really like of us uh, on my last day. Um, so yeah, so that's all I have. Thank you and happy to take any questions.